Hey, cats and kittens. Get it? Cats and kittens. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Grab your drink of choice, whether it be coffee, tea, water, wine, or vodka, disguised to look like water. I won't judge, and neither will anyone else here. It's a safe space. Uh, I have water, but in a fancy cup. So join me. I am going to read you the first chapter of Rockstar's Heart by Kella Campbell. And I would like to give her a huge thank you and major shout out because we talked about me reading this book months ago. <laughs> and of course, there was COVID and remote learning and more COVID and holidays and more COVID. So <laughs> um, now I'm finally here. So thank you, Ms. Kelly Campbell, for being so patient and being awesome and just a wonderful author. Okay, so we have Rockstar's Heart by Kelly Campbell. Chapter one. Chris sat in the semi-dark of the arena up in the nosebleeds with a couple of girlfriends, clutching the arms of her seat. She hadn't expected to feel vertigo, but she'd never been so high up in an arena of this size. The steep elevation of the seats and the distance to the stage below were having a funny effect on her. With white knuckles, she told herself that she would not, could not possibly tip out of her seat and free fall down the endless rows of the balcony and down to the stage. All around, people rustled into their seats, juggling plastic drink cups and neon glow sticks, squirming into brand new smidge tour t-shirts or moaning over the photographs in their glossy souvenir programs. Ooh, look, Chris. Debbie, look at this one of Angel. Leah's words almost came out on a squeal as she thrust her program toward them and jabbed a finger at one of the pictures. Soaking wet and with shirt ripped half off, the lead singer appeared to be in the process of unbuttoning his jeans with a devilish smirk on his handsome face. Water droplets glimmered in his bleached platinum crew cut and along high cheekbones. Narrowed green eyes held an invitation. Debbie leaned across Chris to have a look. Pfft, so fake. She craned her neck for a better view of the suggestive pose and the vocalist's semi-revealed muscular chest. Chris looked too. I like this one of Blade best, she said, pointing to another picture which featured Smidge's guitarist, dark in shadow and leather, Pinpoint light glinting on his lip and eyebrow piercings as he cradled his guitar with a hint of bitter tenderness. Leah laughed. You've got creepy taste, Chris. Blade's too hardcore for me. Angel's the hottest for sure, but some of these pictures of Dice are kind of yummy too. Dice's poses weren't quite as openly sexual as the others. The drummer was the youngest of the smidge boys, a cute kid brother joker with an appealing, half-innocent grin. Okay, so maybe Angel technically has the best cheekbones and abs, but that doesn't make him the sexiest or the best date. Debbie turned her program to a shot of the bass player, a fallen seraph, all golden curls and the bluest eyes. I'd go for easy in a heartbeat if I had a chance, she said with a hint of a blush. Chris's eyes met Leah's and their lips twitched. Debbie was a dead sucker for any nice guy gone bad, and it never ended well. Honey, can we get by? Asked an athletic man with spiky hot pink hair, touching Leah on the shoulder to get her attention. His two friends crowded behind him, shoving good-naturedly and balancing plastic cups of beer. All three wore t-shirts with the acid green logo of the opening band and spotted gelled up hair and facial piercings. They fit in with the crowd much more so than the girls did. Our seats are next to yours, I think, he added. I'm Johnny and these are Reese and Adam. Leah and my friends are Debbie and Chris, she said, hopping up to let them squeeze by, maybe squeezing a little closer than absolutely necessary. 
Her hair snagged on a button of Adam's denim jacket, and he laughed, untangling her as he wedged past. Adam had young Lenny Kravitz dreads and an attractive smile. You girls want something to drink? He asked, with a diffident shrug to show that it didn't much matter either way. No strings, just drinks, you know? Leah glanced at Chris and Debbie. After almost four years of university, they were used to having at least some tenuous connection with the guys they met. A shared class, a mutual acquaintance, familiar territory. And these were completely unknown quantities, with nothing in common but concert tickets in the same row. Attractive, though. Leah's eyes begged her friends to agree to keep the conversation going. Well, I love a beer, said Debbie, prodding Chris with an elbow to say yes as well. Although her mother wouldn't have approved, and she wasn't sure she felt comfortable taking drinks from strangers, Chris nodded. Sure, please. She liked the look of these men with their gelled hair and piercings. Easy enough to imagine them in rock star makeup, a bit of eyeliner and sparkle, like the smidge boys in their beefcake photos. Leah giggled, her cheeks pink under her freckles. You won't be able to carry all that, Adam. I'd better come down with you. Adam shot his friends a look that plainly said four cups was hardly a challenge, but he wasn't going to turn down a pretty girl's company. You bet, he agreed, with another wide smile, gesturing for her to precede him along the row of seats toward the aisle. Chris and Debbie stood and squeezed back against their seats as Johnny and Reese pushed past, checking them over with interested eyes. Chris looked downward to avoid their assessment, and the vertigo hit her again as she took in the drop to the stage. With an inadvertent moan of distress, she sank back into her seat, groping for the armrests. Reese turned toward her, concerned. Hey, you okay? I'm fine, Chris said, shaking her head, though she could feel the blush rushing to her cheeks. It's stupid. I've never been so high up in an arena before. I get kind of dizzy when I look down. She gazed at her feet, eyes fixed on her shoes, hair falling forward as though she could hide behind it. It's not stupid, Reese assured her. They call these the nosebleeds for a reason, but it's ridiculously expensive to sit further down. We couldn't afford better seats either. Shut up, said Johnny. None of anyone's business what we can or can't afford. Reese just laughed. Come on, Johnny. Who'd be sitting up here if they could be down there? That's true enough, Debbie agreed. Still, I guess they can charge whatever people are willing to pay. It's unreal how popular smidges become. Did you guys see them on their first tour here? Nah, said Johnny. Didn't know much about them then. I mean, I heard Skanky Treat on the radio, of course. Who didn't? But it was impossible to get tickets, and then they didn't even come here on their second big tour. Anyway, I didn't really get into Smidge until My Tainted Baby was released. I've liked Smidge from the beginning, but I couldn't get tickets to the Skanky Treat tour either. Nobody could. Reese shook his head. Their stuff has gotten more and more commercial, though. It's a shame. Even Human Lollipop had more original material on it than they're doing now. Debbie squeaked an indignant protest at that. But they're on the radio and TV all the time, and selling out every arena on their tour. They're bigger than anything. She held up the glossy souvenir program in illustration. Reese and Johnny both laughed. That's kind of my point, Reese said. But... I'm here, aren't I? Chris only smiled. Men always pretended to know so much about music, were so quick to fling around words like commercial and generic. Surely it was all subjective in the end. You either connected to it or you didn't. Mostly a matter of taste. And as Reese had said, they were here. On the stage below, the opening band had started to general disregard from the crowd waiting for Smidge. The seats filled up and excitement built as a murmur circulated throughout the arena that the Smidge boys had arrived in the building. 
Leah and Adam returned with the promised beer, and when they shuffled down the row and Chris and Debbie stood to let Adam by, Leah gestured to her friends to move one seat along, saying to Adam, why don't you sit with me? The girls can move down. Sure, Adam agreed easily. So Chris shrugged and moved down. Then Johnny told Reese to swap with Debbie. And Chris found herself next to Reese, while Johnny chatted up Debbie down the row. As the fog machine began to fill the arena with rolling clouds of powder, scented white mist, and the spotlights focused down on the stage, Chris's feeling of vertigo subsided. Maybe it was the fog? Filling up the space that had threatened to overwhelm her? Or maybe she'd become acclimated to the height and vastness of the arena? Or maybe it was the man sitting beside her who put such trivial considerations out of her mind? She glanced over at him, Reese, who had reacted so considerately to her distress, who spoke with a gentleness that seemed unconnected to the tough look of his piercing and spiked hair. As she observed him, he turned his head and met her eyes. You have a lot of piercings, she blurted out. Reese smiled, touching the ring in one nostril ruefully. Most of these are fake, he admitted with a laugh. Clip-ons and magnets. I'm an actor, so I know how to look the part, you know? A couple of the ones in my ears are real, but that's it. Chris laughed too. Wow, I'd love to be able to, well, look the part like that too, she said. I suppose I'll always look like the good little girl I am, though. I don't know how to seem tough. I always feel like an underage schoolgirl at concerts and bars. So pathetic. <laughs> and worse, to babble on like that about it, she thought. But something about Reese invited confidences. My friend Amy has the same problem. A young and innocent face. Reese looked at her with professional consideration. As an actor, it's a career advantage for her, and she gets lots of work because of it. But she also gets typecast. Going out, though? Okay, she plays it up, makes it work for her. Knee-high socks, you know, short schoolgirl skirts and pigtails and a lollipop. She gets tons of attention. Picturing herself in a pleated plaid miniskirt, Chris wondered whether maybe her baby doll face was less of a liability than she'd thought. Her mother always said that a nice cashmere sweater and good jewelry would give her some sophistication, but embracing the innocent look sounded like a lot more fun. Reese must have noticed her brightening at the notion as he took on a serious expression and added, of course, Amy isn't young or innocent, so she can handle it. Don't uh, get yourself into a situation based on what I've said. I probably shouldn't have suggested it. I won't try it, really, Chris agreed. But it's a lovely idea. And Reese was a lovely gentleman, she thought. Someone who took her frustration seriously, but also worried about what might happen to her if she did tart up and go out like jailbait. Wouldn't it be wonderful if he asked for her number? If he wanted to see her again? On her right, Leah chattered away at top volume while Adam nodded in agreement. And on the other side of Reese, Johnny leaned close to Debbie, his mouth close to her ear, saying something that made her laugh. The opening act finished playing, and with a blast of electronic thunder, the entire arena was plunged into pitch darkness. A voice seemed to roar from everywhere at once. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Smidge! The stage exploded into a mass of light and dazzle. Pyrotechnics blasted and strobes flashed, lasers whirled, slowly rising into the spotlights from the trap doors in the stage came the Smidge Boys! Jumbotron screens lighting to show their ascent in close-up. Rock gods they were, made up in glitter and flash, hair sprayed stiff with blue and silver stuff, glorious in artfully ripped, dark denim, studded leather, black mesh, rhinestones, and LED lights. Angel of the satanically elegant face, 
actually wore a pair of white feathered wings as he rose to the stage. Leah reached across Adam's lap to squeeze Chris's hand in excitement. The thundering sound effects were much too loud for conversation, but the hand squeeze told Chris that Leah found the wings effective. Reaching the stage, Angel picked up his guitar and strode forward to the stands that held his mic, raising one arm in salute to the crowd. Behind him, Dice, in a jester's cap, jumped up onto the drum riser and lifted his drumsticks with an impish grin. And Elias squeezed Chris's hand again. Then Easy, with his blue and silver streaked fair hair glowing like a halo in the spotlights, took his bass from its stand and held it aloft in greeting to the crowd, like the lover boy he was, basking in the shrieks of response as he stepped up to flank Angel. Blade, though, paid little attention to the screaming fans as he collected his guitar. He seemed focused inward as he lifted up the instrument and settled into position, adjusting the strap. All in black, he wore a spike-studded dog collar around his neck and leather cuffs around his wrists. A sleeveless vest showed off the ink on his arms. He moved into position. And magnified on the Jumbotron screens, he gave a sharp nod to Angel, saying without words, I'm ready. Let's do this. Music filled the arena. Drums like gunfire, heavy bass, and power guitar. A rock anthem that had most of the audience up on their feet. As Angel gripped his mic close and began to pour his passionate words into it, a raw moaning noise swept around the arena. Thousands of delighted voices responding to him in appreciation. Rock gods weren't for falling in love with. Chris knew. They were for daydreams and fantasy, for wishful thinking in between boyfriends. But as she gazed down at the stage, irresistibly drawn to the smidge boys in their stage makeup and punk hair, especially Blade with the metal in his face, she wondered if she'd ever find a regular guy to date who attracted her in that way. Next to Chris, Reese sat watching the concert, absorbed in the music. As an actor, he looked the part because he'd chosen to do so for the night. Presumably, he could also look the part of a nice, appropriate, sane and normal boyfriend if he wanted to. Not that he'd said anything about wanting to see her again. Chris wondered if, in some imaginary, perfect world, he would be convinced to wear his fake piercings for her. If, and she felt a bit hot in the concert darkness at the thought, he would wear them to make love to her. Reese, the actor, must be well used to the stage makeup too. It wasn't such a stretch to think of him with a bit of eyeliner darkening around his eyes. Would he do that too, for her, if she asked him? God, I'm such a fool, she muttered to herself, her words eaten up by the concert sound all around. How could she be thinking these thoughts about someone she'd just met? On the stage below, Smidge segued into a power ballad duet, Angel singing the part of a relationship-bound man longing for sexual freedom, with Blade taking up a second microphone to sing the contrasting part, the promiscuous adventurer longing for love. For every night when the bed sheets burned, for every night when thunder rolled, I've longed to find a princess, one love to have and to hold, Blade sang, his raspy, deep voice a counterpoint to Angel's more melodic one. Reese hadn't given any sort of clue as to how forward he was in that direction. A fragrant, skunkish smoke drifted over them. Chris glanced around to see if she could see where it was coming from. More particularly, she was curious to know whether the three guys they'd met were responsible for the smoke. Reese noticed her curious eyes. He laughed. None of us do it, he said into her ear. I used to, but I've given it up. So is Adam, and Johnny never did. I'm such a child. Sorry, said Chris. She had to speak up for him to hear her, but with a loud ambient sound, it had the effect of a whisper. Don't be sorry. You're curious. You don't know us. It's natural. Reese reached over and took her hand. Let's enjoy the concert, huh? 
As the band on the stage, far below, shifted into one of their fast-paced club hits, he squeezed her fingers and didn't let go. When the lights finally came up at the end of the concert, after the last of the fog from the machines and the smoke from the pyrotechnics had faded, Chris had the strange feeling of emerging from a dream, ears ringing and aching from the barrage of sound. While the others put on their coats and gathered up programs and purses, she looked down at the bare distant stage, the vertigo long gone, where workers unplugged and carried away instruments, packed equipment into large black cases, swept up glitter and assorted debris. Had Smidge even really been there? The dream world of laser lights and silver confetti, spotlights and swirling fog had disappeared under the bright arena floodlights, and all over the building, the chattering crowd swarmed outward while the black boards of the stage stood abandoned. Come on, space cadet, it's time to go, Leah said, gently prodding Chris's shoulder. Don't forget your coat. But before she could bend to get it, Reese had scooped it up and was holding it out for her to slip her arms in. She turned to thank him, and he smiled. Then they were filing out, an inch at a time, stuck in a human traffic jam as the sold-out arena emptied itself of occupants. Leah and Adam made their way along the row of seats and into the aisle to start the trek down the stairs, and people from other rows wedged themselves into the gap before Chris and Reese could catch up. Debbie and Johnny had been right behind them, but again, the sheer press of numbers had created separation. And in the midst of all the people, Chris was alone with Reese for the first time. I don't like to do this, he said, with the first bit of hesitation he'd shown. But your girlfriends should know that Adam and Johnny aren't exactly standard date candidates. Oh? Mm-hmm. Adam's in what you might call a complicated relationship, and Johnny, well, Johnny's bisexual and prefers open relationships, and most girls get kind of intense about that when they find out. Chris took a quick look back in startled curiosity, but didn't immediately see Johnny. Though his hot pink hair should have made him visible, even among all the people on the stairs, and Reese hadn't said anything of himself. What about you? she asked. Are you a complicated date, too? Well, I'm an actor, he said with a wry smile. But if that doesn't scare you off, I'd like to get your phone number. Chris wrote her number on the back of his ticket stub. There you go. Crystal Murphy. That's a pretty name, Reese said, looking at the ticket stub. What's your last name, then? Davies. Davies. I like that, said Chris. He couldn't possibly know that she was trying herself out as Mrs. Davies in her head, could he? I really do hope you call me, she added. I will call you Crystal Murphy, said Reese Davies. Believe me, I will. At the bottom of the steps, they found Adam and Leah and waited for Johnny and Debbie. When the pair turned up, Chris couldn't help eyeing Johnny in semi-shocked fascination. She couldn't put what Reese had said out of her mind. Had Johnny made love to both men and women? Did he have them both at the same time, or one at a time? Debbie, who was deeply into exclusivity and promise rings and relationship status conversations, wouldn't be able to cope with an alternative arrangement. Then Chris had to wonder how she herself would handle it. Not that she was even interested in Johnny, but a lover who had other lovers who didn't buy into the one boy, one girl, forever model of things, could she be strong enough, open enough for that? And there was Reese watching her watch Johnny with an odd half smile on his face. Oh, good God, he knows I'm thinking about sex. And then they were saying their goodnights in the main concourse of the arena, standing to one side of the herd of bodies flowing outward. We could walk out together, help you flag a taxi, Johnny offered, but Leah and Chris shook their heads. And though Debbie looked tempted to drop all caution and abandon her friends, Leah jabbed her in the ribs with an elbow until she agreed with a regretful moo. That's kind of you, but we're taking the train home, 
Leah said, looking around for signs to direct them to the station connected to the arena. So, I guess this is good night. Chris saw Adam kiss Leah on the cheek, but there was no promise in his body language. Debbie, on the other hand, had lost the lipstick off her lips on the journey down the stairs, and Johnny had a hand resting intimately on her lower back as he murmured something in her ear. Chris couldn't meet Reese's eyes. Chris, he said softly. She raised her eyes and he was looking straight at her, telling her without words that he wanted to kiss her, asking without words whether she wanted a kiss goodnight. And because she didn't know the answer to that, he didn't press her. Next time then. A promise. The queue for the women's washroom was staggering. Are you sure you have to go, Deb? Leah asked. We'll be back at our place in less than 20 minutes. Or you could use the ladies in the station. It's bound to be less crowded. Absolutely not, replied Debbie, wrinkling her nose. Gotta go. You know what I'm like after drinking beer? There's no way I can wait the whole way home. And I'm not going near the station washroom. Disgusting. You shouldn't drink if you can't hold your pee, Leah muttered. Fine, go and get in line then. We'll wait for you at the exit. It was one of those washrooms with inflow and outflow doors, allowing the herd of women to file in at one end to use the toilet stalls, then move on to the rows of sinks, then out by the other door. Debbie, clearly too content with her night to be offended by Leah's sourness, waved cheerily in agreement and scooted off to get in line before the wait grew any longer. Leah rolled her eyes at Chris. Honestly, Debbie's bladder is the size of a toddler's. Chris raised her eyebrows. It wasn't like Leah to be so negative. What's the matter, Leah? If you have to know, Adam didn't make any move to see me again. No phone number, no hint that we could connect online, nothing. His loss. Chris thought for a moment and then decided that, as much as she disliked passing on hearsay, her friend deserved to know what Reese had said. Listen, it wasn't you. Reese told me that Adam is in a complicated relationship of some sort. I think he meant for me to let you know so you wouldn't feel bad. I mean, Adam obviously enjoyed your company. He just isn't single. That's my usual rotten luck. Why do I always get the unavailable ones? Leah cursed under her breath. At least Debbie might get laid sometime soon. She clearly had a bit of a grope on the stairs, huh? I wonder if that Johnny asked for her number. Chris sighed. As to that, you might as well know what Reese said about Johnny. And I don't think he was kidding. Apparently, Johnny, um goes both ways, you know? Ew, that's nasty. Debbie would freak if she knew. And she let him kiss her too. Leah shook her head. And she thought she'd catch something from the subway washroom. The scandal in her voice was tinged with relish. And her expectant expression said she was waiting for Chris to agree, to validate the horror and deliciousness of it. I... Don't think we should, um, judge him like that. Sure, it's different, and Debbie won't like it, but he and his friends seem nice. I expect he, well, you know, practices safe sex and all that. Leah snorted in disgust. Oh, come on, Miss Vanilla Virgin. Don't pretend you're not as squicked out by it as I am. Or is this some churchy, love the sinner, hate the sin thing? Wow, Leah. You know me better than that, don't you? Try his body, his choice, okay? They looked at each other uncomfortably silent. Fine, whatever. Leah crossed her arms and contemplated the remains of the crowd with a scowl. Chris shrugged outwardly at Leah's grumpiness but couldn't help hearing the hurtful words over and over in her mind, wondering if her friends really thought of her as a churchy vanilla virgin. To pass the time, she too watched the shifting masses of people. 
A man in a dark suit was moving through the crowd, with a clipboard and pen in hand, and a security earpiece in his ear. He didn't look like a member of the security team, though. Those wore yellow jackets with silver reflective stripes and SECURITY in big letters across the back. This man seemed out of place among the concert goers, an executive sort, and the suit looked expensive. He observed the crowd intently, occasionally checking his clipboard and speaking into what had to be a microphone clipped to his lapel. He had to be either looking for someone or watching for some sort of activity or behavior. His eyes connected with Chris's and his gaze sharpened. She looked away at once, trying to appear nonchalant, but she could feel her cheeks reddening at the thought of having been caught watching him. Whatever his purpose was, she'd no call to stare at him like that. Moments later, Debbie emerged from the washroom. Come on, let's go, Chris said at once. Do either of you know where we are in relation to the subway entrance? Well, it's by the northwest gate, and I think I saw a sign, Debbie began. Debbie, you won't believe what Chris told me about your new friend, Johnny. You'll be absolutely sick. Leah interrupted. "Uh, Excuse me, said the man in the expensive suit and security earpiece, right there at their elbows, making them jump. May I ask you ladies a few questions? It will only take a moment. He appeared to be conducting some sort of marketing survey. Had they enjoyed the concert? Had they purchased a souvenir program? Looking at the program, could they show him the photos they liked best? Which smidge boy did each of them find most attractive? Were they speaking as single girls, or did they have boyfriends? They answered the man's questions and pointed at pictures, and just as they were beginning to eye each other with a touch of impatience, he smiled in a pleased but slightly calculating way and thanked them for their time and assistance. It was no trouble. We're glad to have helped, said Chris with a polite smile. Leah and Debbie nodded in agreement, eager to be on their way. But the man reached into his jacket and extracted three laminated tags. No, really, your answers are much appreciated. In return for that, let me do you a favor. You'd like to meet the smidge boys, wouldn't you? You've got to be kidding, Leah said. The man shook his head. Not at all, young lady. Part of the promotional activities they're contracted for includes meeting individual fans backstage after the concert. In this case, we're using that access as appreciation for assistance with our survey. The explanation rang slightly false, as though there had to be more to it, but the tags he handed them were actual backstage passes with serial numbers and holographic seals of authenticity, and he spoke into a microphone clipped to his lapel, summoning an assistant to escort them in. The assistant appeared almost immediately, a tough-looking woman who looked like she could be in her late 30s, or maybe she was younger and lived and partied harder than most. She wore what might have been a power suit if it hadn't been made of black leather, and a black satin shirt unbuttoned rather too far. Diamond studs gleamed in her ears. Marigold will take care of you, said the man. Thanks again. The leather-suited woman spoke into a two-way radio. I'm bringing three more in for photo op and autographs, alert to one possible authorized by Mr. Kinney. A static hiss and an assenting response issued from the radio speaker. Right this way, follow me. Please refrain from touching anything in the backstage space and immediately obey any instructions given to you by the backstage public relations manager or any member of the crew for your own safety and comfort. She recited the string of directives without pause or inflection. She must have given the same spiel hundreds of times. You will have a brief opportunity to speak with the band members. They will sign your programs if you'd like them to do so. We ask that you not take any personal photographs or recordings of any sort in the backstage space. Her patronizing look suggested that given the privilege of breathing the same air as the Smidge Boys, no one would dare to find these arrangements less than satisfactory. She marched along ahead of them at a brisk pace, exuding a strong aura of being much too busy and important to escort little girls around to meet the band. Chris patted her hair anxiously, wishing she'd brought a hairbrush. Why would she have brought a hairbrush to a concert? 
and wondering if she might get a chance to touch up her lipstick. She saw Leah straightening her shirt and Debbie undoing and then doing up the top buttons of her denim jacket. In silence, the three of them savored tingles of anticipation as Marigold led them through a steel door and down a long concrete ramp, up a short flight of stairs and along a carpeted hallway, stopping at a door with a plaque that read Lounge A. Pinned to a corkboard below the plaque was a paper notice with the words Guest Holding Lounge, No Admittance, Without Passes. Marigold spoke into her radio, and the door was opened from the inside. Hello, ladies. Please come in and have a seat, said a tall man in a smidge crew t-shirt and dark jeans with a skull-patterned bandana covering his head. Freestanding banners with images of the smidge boys in concert brightened up an otherwise bland room. A couple of basic beige sofas matched the industrial wallpaper. The crewman turned to Marigold. Goldie, could you tell Ken that this has got to be it for her tonight? The boys have had enough. Marigold shot him a withering look, but he shrugged it off. Hey, not my doing. I'm just passing the word along. Whatever. So, introduce me? He inclined his head toward the girls. Leah, Debbie, and this one is Chris, snapped Marigold, pointing them out. Jed is the crew person in charge of backstage public relations, so he'll take care of you. And she turned on her heel and walked out. Busy lady, said Jed, with a look that suggested he didn't think much of her. Now, have some snacks, make yourselves comfortable, and I'll need you to fill out these waivers before I take you in. He handed them each a small clipboard. Legal stuff, you know. Personal liability waiver in case you slip and hit your head. And there's also a photographic model release in there. I think Goldie told you that you can't take personal photos. The girls bobbed their heads. Management doesn't want random cameras popping off all over the place. So our photographer takes the pictures and our guests get autographed prints in the mail. But we need you to sign a model release form so that we can do that. Sound good to you? The girls sat there, gazing at the waiver forms in their hands, half reading the legal ease and hardly taking it in as they thought about what Jed had said. Photos with Smidge, after all, and something better than a blurry phone camera shot. Chris signed her waiver form, printing her address and phone number as instructed. When she handed it to Jed, he asked to see some ID, then peeled a barcode sticker from the back of her backstage pass and stuck it onto her waiver form then stuck a fluorescent green star on the front of her pass. He repeated the process for Leah and Debbie, although they got orange stars instead of green. Jed's assessing look as he handed back the passes gave Chris the idea that the green star was somehow significant. Uncomfortably aware of her most likely rumpled hair and lack of lipstick, Chris finally cleared her throat and asked, is there a mirror I could use somewhere around here? I kind of like to fix myself up before. Don't worry about it. Sally will be, ah, you'll have a chance at a mirror before you go in. Jed smiled and gestured at the table. Have some snacks, have something to drink. Chris obediently took a can of Dr. Pepper from the ice bucket and cracked it open. The sweet liquid fizzed on her tongue and slipped down her throat. And she tried not to worry about what one should or should not say to famous people on meeting them. Leah reached for a diet Sprite and clunked it against Chris's Dr. Pepper, saying, here's to meeting the hottest band on the planet. Let's hope we have better luck than we did in the audience. What do you mean better luck? Debbie asked. I don't know about you, but I had a great time. And what's more, Johnny asked for my, well, crap said Leah. We were about to tell you when we got interrupted by that PR man. For the love of God, now is not the time. Seriously, Chris interrupted. We're about to go and meet Smidge. Can we talk about this later? But let's just leave it till we get home, Chris said. Come on, girls, please help me figure out what to say to the legends I've been daydreaming about for the past year, okay? That's right, we might actually have to say something to them. Debbie let out a little gasp of excitement. I still can't believe we're really going to meet Smidge. 
Leah grinned, widening her eyes and putting on a love-struck expression. How about, hi, I've been fantasizing about you for the past year. You're hot. Can I have your autograph? Jed, watching them, laughed. <laughs> you don't need to worry, ladies, he said. You say hello, they'll ask you if you enjoyed the concert and what your favorite song is. You answer them, then the photographer will arrange you for pictures. Afterward, they'll tell you it was nice meeting you, and you'll tell them it was an honor. That's it. You don't need to have a speech prepared or anything. The girls laughed too. Put like that, it sounded pretty straightforward. And yet, remembering that she'd dreamed of Blade naked, dreamed of touching his bare skin, Chris couldn't see how it could be so simple to come face to face with him. The two-way radio on Jed's desk bleeped and chattered, and he jumped up to open the door for a woman with slicked down electric orange hair, whose smidge crew t-shirt stretched over an impressively stacked chest. She carried a square silver case, which she set down and opened to reveal neatly arranged trays of brushes, tubes, and tins. This is Sally, said Jed. She's going to touch up your hair and makeup, and they'll be ready for you in the lounge by the time she's done. I won't need to do much, I shouldn't think, added Sally, with a calm smile that immediately put them at ease. All three of you have lovely skin. A dab of powder and some highlighter should do it, okay? She hooked a chair with one foot and dragged it over, positioning it in front of Chris before she sat. You got a lipstick you want me to use, honey, or should I choose one of mine? Sally's efficient hands moved over Chris's face, buffing, dusting, dabbing, and then she was done, and Chris sat looking into Sally's hand mirror while Sally moved on to Leah. It didn't look like makeup, what Sally had done. Only a general impression of matte, healthy skin and freshened lipstick. Chris passed the mirror along to Leah, and in no time at all, Debbie was inspecting herself in the mirror, and Sally was packing up her kit. Thank you so much, Chris said to Sally. Do we um, give you a tip or anything? Not at all, honey, but you're so sweet to offer. And listen, just be yourself in there, okay? He likes natural girls, not too much makeup and flash, so you'll do fine. Luck and love to you. And with a wink and a wave, Sally was out the door with her case. He likes, you'll do fine? What had Sally meant? Jed saw Chris's puzzled face and gave her a thumbs up sign, which puzzled her even more, just as a bleep sounded from his radio. On our way, said Jed into the radio. Okay, ladies, they're ready for us. Follow me. Out into the hall they went, down and around a corner to another door, lounge B, with a security guard sitting at the table outside and a paper tacked to the door's cork board reading, Meet and greet. Passes must be scanned by security prior to admittance. Please leave all cameras and phones with security before entering. The security guard nodded to Jed and solemnly scanned each girl's pass before holding out a basket labeled cameras and phones. Chris fished her phone out of her purse and powered it down before dropping it into the basket without hesitation. But Debbie looked at hers reluctantly before parting with it. You'll get it back, said the security guard with an expression of utmost patience. Pardon me, you with the red hair, do you have a phone to turn in? Nope, lost it last week and I haven't got another yet, said Leah, holding her purse open to show its lack of contents. A lipstick tube, key ring, a change purse lay forlorn at the bottom of it, along with her driver's license and debit card and a couple of crumpled up receipts. Very well. The security guard picked up his radio. He pressed a button and someone on the other side of the door pushed it open. And that is the end of chapter one. So what will happen? What's going to happen? What do you think? What's, what's up with Chris? Why does she have a green star? I don't know. I wanna know. It's gonna be, it's like, and, and who's the he? Is the he bla Blade? Like, we want it to be Blade, obviously Blade. And more importantly, if you were a fan of the Smidge Boys, would you want the angel singer, the cute, almost not quite innocent drummer, the 
guy who's so confident he knows that he's all you'll ever need basis or the bad boy. I know which one I would pick. We haven't even met Blade and I'm already like that one. That one. I would like to lick him and keep him forever. Thank you. <laughs> so here's the deal. You can pick up Rockstar's Heart on Amazon. It is not currently available on Audible. So if you want it on Audible, like nag a kill and be like, hey, I need the audio for this. Okay. And hopefully she'll be able to get that at some point because that would be awesome. I'm an audiobook lover. Um, if you have any questions about it, or want to chat, please comment below. And we'll see if we can get Miss Kella Campbell in on the conversation and give us the deets on all of her sexy boys. Because we like our rock stars, right? All right, everybody. Thank you for hanging out with me for this video. I hope that this worked well. I am like, I'm trying all kinds of new things. I don't know what I'm doing. I just fake it till I make it. So I hope you're enjoying these and I will see you again next time with another chapter from another book from another fabulous author who's been incredibly patient. So thank you guys. I love you all. Enjoy the book and we'll see